We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be joining us from today, and especially hello to everyone in Poland. Uh, we would love to be able to join you. So this is a great moment for us, uh, members of this working group. Uh, to, we're delighted, actually, to have been invited to uh, moderate and facilitate and speak at one of your session on Internet's governance at this uh, forum. And uh, thanks especially to the United Nations and the government of Poland for organizing and hosting this exciting conference. We're right in the theme of what we're gonna be presenting. My name is Charles Valeran. I am uh, your moderator today and I'm speaking to you directly live from Alexandria, Egypt. So I'm apo my apologies if the internet connection is not uh, robust, solid. I might have to turn my video camera off should that happen. Today's session will look at the multi-stakeholderism, such an important and long word. At, uh, so how is multi-stakeholderism at work to address the very important digital issues surrounding the diversity of content online? And we have a diversity of content online initiative that some of our speakers will be presenting to you today. We are joined by some of the members of the working group. Uh, that was formed to develop these uh, guiding principles. They will share their thoughts and their experiences in this process. What are the next steps and how you can join? Uh, so for some of you that might be interesting. Uh, I, I just wanna also emphasize that this is a second uh, such uh, workshop that these uh, people have delivered. My, some of you might have attended last uh, week's Freedom Online Conference where a similar uh, session was, uh, was presented. So they're very motivated in two weeks, two session to a very, I'm, I'm sure, motivated uh, group of individual, uh, very interested uh, crowd. So before we start, few instructions. We are recording. Uh, we'll uh, also take your questions. Uh, we'll uh, try to be brief. So we keep the last 10 minutes to answer some of those questions that may be coming in. Uh, there are two ways to submit, either in the chat you're familiar, I'm sure, with this, and we'll keep track as they come. I might actually read some of them before and during the panel, just to inform our discussion, but we'll keep answers at the end. And, and second is simply to raise your hand as we normally uh, would do, but let's do that at the end for sure if it's uh, hand raising. So now let's turn to our panelists, and uh, I will ask uh, for everyone to him introduce her, uh, sorry, to introduce him or herself. And when you do uh, introduce yourself, please explain how this uh, important work, the working group, the guiding principle and in this initiative connects with what you're doing, where you are either in government, in research or in civil society. Uh, I'll uh, start with uh, Suzanne Nikolchev. She's uh, with the, we can see it in the background, L'Observatoire Européen de l'Audiovisuel. European uh, Observ uh, Audiovisual Observatory, and I could say Europanische Audiovisual Wirt. I can't read. Maybe you can say it. Suzanne, please introduce yourself. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much for this nice introduction and to help you with the last uh, version of our trilingual name. It's Europäische Audiovisuelle Informationsstelle, and that's ah. the German. Part. We have three working languages and uh, you made them quite aware. Thank you for that to the audience. Now, uh, I am uh, Susanna Nikolchev, the executive director of the European Audiovisual Observatory, which is a part of the Council of Europe. We have 42 members, 40 states from Europe are members, plus Morocco, plus the European Union. And uh, we, what's our task? What do we do? We collect, analyze, and distribute information and data on the audiovisual sector in Europe, 
all of this with a view to better understand the key market conditions and legal framework. So diversity of content has always been an important topic for us before it went online also, but certainly after it went online. And our various databases and reports provi provide the factual basis actually to evaluate some of the important elements of diversity. For example, the information we have of media ownership or also of uh, funding of the creation of audiovisual content. Now, I joined the group in order to share some of our insight um, with regard to the topics that are dealt in the guiding principles, which are also our topics. But I also shared it in order to raise a little bit awareness of our mother house, the Council of Europe, because they work on these issues in parallel. And um, there is a lot that um, this initiative and actually the daily work of the Council shares be it uh, media pluralism, independence and financing of public service media, safety of journalists, cybercrime, artificial intelligence, to mention just the most prominent. So there was enough reason for me to join in a purely informative, not a standard setting function, because that's not what the observatory is uh, set up to do. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. So for those that don't know the observatory, you're based in Strasbourg. Exactly. And uh, I should also mention that uh, you conduct research, you have databases, but you also have a very good service of tracking legal development in the media sphere. Uh, I think you're one of the authoritative sources on, on these uh, legal issues. How so. oh, could I contradict you? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Maria Luisa Stasi, Article 19. You're based in London. Please introduce your work. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, and thank you for uh, inviting me to be here uh, again uh, having this conversation. So I am, um, yes, as you rightly said, I work for RT19, uh, which is a, an international free speech organization. So um, the topic, uh, media diversity online, is very much in line with what we try to do and to advocate for uh, in a number of fora and, and uh, with a number of, of regulators, legislators, but also other stakeholders uh, all around the globe. So um some sometimes and in, in some areas at the moment the discussions are a little bit more um hot let's say <laughs> and uh, there are more developments uh but um i think this is truly a global issue and that's why perhaps this this multi-stakeholder setting is one of the best we could think of um as a free speech organization we've always been interested in in issues like media plurality and media diversity and i think the online dimension uh it's a, it's a very uh um very clear paradigm of the fact that uh, the, the two things so the public media media diversity as a public interest uh, issue for democracy and free expression the individual free expression they're they're very much overlapping online uh, when we talk about uh, how the the uh, um, the way we act, we as individuals we access share uh, content uh, uh, and uh, um, who controls or how is shaped our information diet there are there are always these two layers the individual free expression and the collective dimension which is diversity of exposure of of individuals and citizens so that's uh, uh, that's why. Uh, I've been uh, working with the group uh, and um, willing to continue to do so. Yeah, so bringing a civil society and I should say advocacy, and you're also a militant organization, you really defend uh, these rights, and your personal background is legal, so you look at this with the lens of legal expertise to make sure Indeed. that these notions and concepts are going to be eventually enforced. Yes, indeed. I'm part of the law and policy team uh, and I'm based at the international office, but we do have a various regional organization with people with the same or similar expertise. So we can do that, uh, uh, that kind of advocacy in different areas of the world as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Wolfgang Vonhas, I'm very pleased to meet you. We haven't met before virtually, but I'm very impressed. You have a very good voice. So please, sir, tell us about yourself and the work you do. Thank you very much, and uh, thank, uh, thanks to Poland and the uh, United Nations for having us on this uh, uh, panel. Uh, I'm head of uh, a unit uh, responsible for international, international media affairs, broadcast, and our foreign 
uh, broadcaster uh, Deutsche Welle at the Federal Government Commissioner for Culture and Media in the Federal Chancellery. A long title, but it was not my idea, so uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, when the Canadian, when the Canadian uh, government reached out to us, uh, asking us uh, for participation in this uh, group, we were just busy preparing the German uh, presidency, the German EU presidency. We had uh, in the uh, second half of 2020. So we were uh, busy with uh, drafting count council conclusions on safeguarding a free and pluralistic uh, media system, which uh, addresses many of the issues our Canadian colleagues raised in uh, this group. So I was chairing uh, the working party during our presidency, so it uh, fits very well. The issues we dealt uh, during the uh, EU presidency together with the issues the Canadian initiative uh, dealt with. So since the internet does not stop at the German or European uh, border, uh, it seemed logical to us uh, to collaborate uh, with countries, with like-minded uh, countries uh, on these issues. And so thank you very much to the Canadian colleagues uh, for the invitation in this group, uh, invitation to uh, Germany and to have me here on this uh, panel for this group on the governmental side. So thank you very much. Thank you, Schön, Wolfgang. I have a question. Um, when I was listening to you, you presenting yourself, you obviously have a very broad view, almost a bird's eye view on these issues due to your long title, but also responsibilities. Can you tell us, and if you cannot, that's okay, is there a Franco-German alliance on these issues? We know that's very important in the EU and I'm sure it is to Canadians and other partners in this working room. Would you say there's some kind of alliance with the French on this? We are uh, working together in this group very closely with every country uh, in this group, Australia, Finland, France, uh, Canada. But historically, we have a, a strong alliance between Germany and France regarding European policy, it's uh, uh, historical, and it's uh, very, very uh, good that it works also on my level, on our level. So we, are, we have friends and uh, 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 we became friends over the years uh, with the colleagues in the uh, French government, in the French ministry. So we are working very close together not only on these issues, uh, this, this, this regards uh, the whole government, I guess. So it's a, a historical thing, and I think it's a good thing for Europe. Excellent. Thank you for your, for your answer. I was expecting that, but I'm happy you, you, you explained to us. Tessa Sproul. Yes. Hello, Tessa. And please explain what Vubble is here and how you do your work connecting to diversity online, please. Oh, certainly, thank you. And thank you so much for having me and uh, to, to Poland as well for hosting the event. Um, so Vubble is, uh, the word is a video bubble um, is, uh, is our company. And what we do is we focus on video intelligence from transcription to data labeling to distribution. We're in the back end piping, working with media organizations and some education technology providers to help um, put structured data around video content, which is opaque to, to all algorithmic uh, machines. Um, uh, you have to actually tell the machine what a video is about for it to understand what to do with it. <laughs> so, um, so um, and I've been doing this uh, for seven years. Uh, uh, Bubble has been uh, operating before that previously. And, and part of the reason why I'm so passionate about this in particular is that I spent 20 years at the CBC. In the last few, CBC is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, our public broadcaster in Canada. And I'm based in Canada. I'm in Toronto today. Um, and uh, uh, 
I left the CDC in 2014 because I was getting very, very anxious about how um, essentially not just the CDC, but all, all conventional media publishers had abdicated responsibility of distribution in the digital space to platforms that they had no insight into how they were operating. So I thought, is there a better way to, um, to, to um, develop technologies that can be used by uh, media organizations and ed education technology providers um, to, to not just show people ads, <laughs> essentially, but also to, to um, expose them to, to content that they otherwise wouldn't necessarily even know um, that they ought to see. So that's the largest function of, of what we do is to try to try to do that to, to interrogate our own algorithmic systems to understand you know can we can we use these tools to not not just uh, amplify popular or potentially you know um, dangerous content but also to amplify content that people really need to see for a healthy ecosystem to thrive. So that's why I'm here, and I also am a huge. Uh, um, um, uh, I guess policy wonk nerd. I love cultural policy. I did, uh, I did study that as well in my postgraduate uh, work. So, so I love being part of this group, and I really look forward to the conversation today. I think you're a great addition, Tessa. I, I want to emphasize for the people listening to us that you probably have understood by now. We have research, we have civil society, we have private sector, and we have people connecting these concepts, these uh, legal notions or universal notions, I should say back to reality, connecting them to algorithm discoverability and how that's going to operate eventually once we uh, land on Earth. Yeah, and I'll just add to, I forgot to mention too, so obviously Bubble's a very small company, <laughs> a new entrant in, in this space, but uh, I, I'm joined on the working group by uh, Google, Netflix, and Deezer as well. So not just, yeah, there's, there's a few of us in there on the, on the private sector side of things. Excellent, thank you. Michel, bonjour. Hello, Michel. Please introduce yourself and uh, who you represent today. Very important partner in this working group. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. It's great to see uh, everyone uh, this morning. Thank you for having me. So I'm Michel Sabag. I'm the Director General of Broadcasting, Copyright and Creative Marketplace at the Department of Canadian Heritage. Uh, I'm the former chair of the Multi-Stakeholder Working Group on Diversity of Content Online. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you from Gatineau, Quebec. Canada on the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabeg people. Um, and I mean, for me, the, the, this work, of course, has been a, a really important part of, uh, of my, um, uh, you know, of, uh, of the, over the last year and a half, uh, working with the colleagues on this call, uh, but also in my current job where uh, I think uh, we're applying a lot of the guiding principles that we'll mention today uh, in the development of, uh, you know, a number of important legislative pieces whether it's updating our Broadcasting Act uh, or, or other pieces of legislation where we can rely on those guiding principles um, to, to guide us in, in, in the development. So I'm happy again to, uh, to be here today. Thank you. Okay. And Michel, for, to the benefit of, of everyone, uh, Canadian Heritage is actually the Ministry of Culture. Uh, it's not always right. clear in the title of it, but it's the Ministry of Culture. We could add sports because there's a strong components of sports in the mandate of the ministry. And we could also add that uh, uh, should you be interested, there is a launch event of this initiative in 2019, uh, organized, bareheaded by the uh, Department of Canadian Heritage that brought together the same, some of the same players, civil society, academia, international uh, representation, and the platforms themselves and their representatives. Right, Michelle? That is correct. So Canadian Heritage represents or has the mandate for culture, heritage, and sports, and uh, we are, uh, you know, at the, um, at the, we initiated this initiative on diversity of content online uh, back in 2019 uh, with some of the colleagues you see here. So maybe uh, to, for Matthew or Aaron, uh, who will be speaking next and presenting the initiative, it, be, it might be interesting to share the link of the outcome document of the 2019 international launch event of this for those that eventually want to read and see what has been accomplished and we are going uh, next. So Aaron and Matthew, you are actually the, uh, the, the heart of this working group and you're going to be introducing uh, what it does and where it's going, please. Great, thank you, Shal, and thank you for joining us on this panel discussion on how we are moving forward with our guiding principles on diversity of content online. I'm Erin Murray, and my colleague Matthew Higarty and I are policy advisors on the diversity of content online team at Canadian Heritage. And we are delighted to start off with an overview of our initiative. 
So to give you some background, I'll turn it over to Matt and uh, he'll tell you a little bit about how we got started. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron, for that. Now, the heart of this initiative is about our information ecosystems online. And this ecosystem is at a crossroads of sorts at this moment. So for starters, we know that when citizens are exposed to and have access to trustworthy and reliable information, as well as content containing a variety of points of views and perspectives, they're more likely to promote and engage in healthy public discourses, foster greater social inclusion and cohesion, better understand and empathize with different cultures and communities. And very importantly, it builds their resilience to dis and misinformation. Now, we also understand and appreciate that we today have more access to information and content than at any point in time. But are we actually being shown, are we being exposed to a diversity of content when using the platforms and online intermediaries that are increasingly entrenched in our daily lives? Now, I want to be clear by what we mean by diversity. So first, we speak of a diversity of sources. So this includes media pluralism and the non-concentrated ownership of media. Second is a diversity of content. So this includes the genres and content types, the diversity of ideas and viewpoints, as well as linguistic diversity. And last is exposure diversity. Now this concerns itself around the level of exposure and consumption of diverse content by an individual. And it is this point that has been of growing concern amongst academics and civil society organizations over the last years. However, this has been extremely difficult to research, analyze, and quantify for a number of reasons. However, this is not the only item that interests us, but one of several that needs addressing in this space. And because the internet crosses all borders, it is necessary to work with a range of stakeholders to develop solutions. So that's why the Government of Canada has established a multi-stakeholder working group with like-minded countries, civil society, and private sector actors. And the working group's mandate is to develop guiding principles on diversity of content online. So this is to help ensure users and citizens have access and are exposed to our diversity of content when online. Now I'll pass the mic over to Aaron to share more details on the guiding principles themselves. Over to you, Aaron. Great, thanks Matt. So beginning in September, 2020, the working group met nine times and developed these international guiding principles on diversity of content. Um, they were published in June 2021, and we will be adding a link to the landing page for this session so that you can have a look at them there. Uh, but essentially, the guiding principles apply to all stakeholder groups and focus on four key themes deemed essential to the promotion of diversity of content online. So theme one is about promoting online content that reflects different cultures and perspectives, including in local languages. Theme two focuses on ensuring safeguards for fair revenue sharing between digital platforms and creators of online news and cultural content. Theme three focuses on access to diverse news and information to promote strong, healthy public debates. It is also about encouraging media and digital literacy for all citizens to further their ability to critically assess content they encounter, as well as measures to discourage disinformation and misinformation uh, while ensuring respect for the right to freedom of expression. And theme four has links to the other three themes and is about transparency of algorithms so that online users can better understand how algorithms influence the content they are shown. Each stakeholder group can influence these themes in their own way. And in the coming months, members will discuss actions the different groups can take to implement the guiding principles. We expect the guiding principles will continue to evolve over time to keep pace with a continuously evolving online environment. And the multi-stakeholder working group is also working toward building a larger international consensus between countries, private sector, and civil society organizations. So if anyone's interested, uh, you're welcome to get in touch with us and, and we can let you know how, how you might join us uh, with these guiding principles. And uh, we're delighted to have you here today to hear more about our initiative. So I'll pass it back to Shal to get things started with the panel. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, just a quick question to Aaron and 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 uh, Matthew and is this is this uh, and again if you can answer but I'm curious to to hear you on is this the first time you're you're starting to expand the working group and trying to share with uh, other stakeholders the fact that this work has been going on for quite some time now is this is this coming out of the box kind of <laughs> yeah, well, I think the idea behind bringing the working group together was to draft the guiding principles and set out what the core uh, mandate would be. And now when, now that these have been published, we're, we're interested in spreading the word and, um, and getting more interest in our initiative. So, 
yeah, that'd be great yeah. to get. Yeah, it, it's time it. for feedback from the community of users and from the international community, I guess. That's that's the moment. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so don't hesitate. Participants, please send us your questions or comments in the chat. I haven't seen any so far. Uh, so here we go with questions, and I thank you, everyone, for these introductions. Uh, is it possible? My, yeah. Is it possible for from from the room actually to ask questions? Oh sure, you can ask questions, but from the room, we'll take them at the end. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, because we want to hear. I have a number of questions we prepared for this session to sort of share with you our experience, but keep your questions for the for the last ten minutes, especially if they haven't been answered through our our questions and discussions. Yes. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, my first question, and I will turn to Maria Luisa to, to start us with uh, the answer is, uh, Maria Luisa, in your opinion, uh, do you think the multi-stakeholder approach was optimal in developing these guiding principles? Uh, well, I do think that uh, um, it's uh, it's one of the best way to approach this issue because it is of relevance. It's one of the key issues for a, for a variety of stakeholders, and it's not only about uh, economic dynamics on media markets, but it's also about fundamental rights. It's about uh, it's about the free free flow of information in societies or our communication infrastructure, communication diet. So it, it's essential for democracy. And if you think about this, if you think about the topic for, from this perspective, of course, you, you, you don't wish this conversation to happen behind closed doors or to be uh, relegated to a closed dialogue between legislators and big companies or legislators or mm. regulators and big companies. You would like this to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, mm. So this is definitely one of the reasons why a multi-stakeholder solution, uh, it's its way more attractive and I would say way more legitimate as well. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other side, it's also uh, concretely, uh, it's a matter of, of trying to find consensus on, on, on new topics, new concepts, something that it, it has been unexplored or it didn't exist as simply as that uh, a few years ago. Uh, something Sometimes it's about the technology that is used and the impact it has on, on dynamics uh, or, um, uh, with regard to the diversity that Matthew has introduced, the different kind of diversities. Um, and and uh, again, um, I want to say all the forum is better than, than having this conversation in isolation because there is a lot of asymmetry of information in, in the field. So or some, some, sometimes, sometimes some stakeholders simply don't have access to enough information. And I think mm -hmm. one of the good elements of this working group has been that uh, the Canadian heritage has also been uh, complementing our discussions with some research uh, that has been sponsored and then presented during the working groups, and this has been pretty, pretty helpful. Uh, I think uh, the last point I wanted to raise, and I'm sure others will, will have their own perception and priorities, is that uh, not only is about exploring together some, some new concepts, but it's also about trying to align incentives. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that and, um, the different stakeholders, when it comes to these issues, they do have different incentives. And uh, at some point, so some, some compromises are easier to find and others, they're not. So a dialogue there, an open dialogue as possible, as inclusive as possible uh, and as transparent as possible. Uh, it's definitely uh, a, a good way to go, I would say. So this is the right approach. Wolfgang, do you want to add something from your perspective? You have experience in a lot of these international and multilateral uh, forums. So I'm totally in line what Maria said, but I can add uh, uh, that uh, uh, multi-stakeholderism has uh, got two great advantages. Uh, this is uh, a greater legitimacy and a greater acceptance uh, of the results we think. So when some topics are particularly uh, more suitable for made whole, make for a stakeholder, uh, for a multi-stakeholderism, it's a complicated word. <laughs> uh, so, and the, the IGF uh, is the best example uh, how uh, multi-stakeholderism should work. Uh, relating to the internet uh, agenda, the IGF has. Um, mm. So the promotion of diversity Online is an international topic and does not stop at borders. Many actors are affected. Uh, this is 
the best thing for a multi-stakeholder approach uh, in our opinion excellent and i guess i guess we could add that the uh, certainly at the european level but also the international community is starting to have quite a bit of experience in challenging issues now addressing some of these challenging issues I can think of the 205 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expression, which did raise similar kind of challenges in coming to a common understanding of some of the contemporary expressions and diversity notions across the world, universal. So I guess we're, we're prepared to tackle such challenging uh, issues nowadays. Uh, let's meet, let me turn to Tessa, and Tessa, we've heard Great things about multi-stakeholderism. There, there might have been some challenges. I want to hear you on, on challenges. And especially, I, I think it'll be interesting for some of the people listening to us to hear that the platforms are in the room. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and, and that has been a bit of the, some of the challenges in that as well, because you know um, the spectrum of you know, platforms that actually have a substantial amount of uh, influence and impact on, on what we encounter in the digital space every moment of every day. Um, they're also under intense scrutiny, we know, in, in, in certain regions and in, in regulatory uh, discussions that are happening right now and have been happening throughout the time that we've been working as a, as a working group as well. So it's been, um, that has been a slight challenge, I would say, or more than slight actually, is that uh, sometimes the representation from the larger platforms, they, you know, it's, um, it's very sensitive and there's a, there's a lot of uh, things that are in balance and being considered um, from, from their perspective. I have the great advantage of being a very small company that can, uh, that can say things uh, and be a little bit more brash and, uh, and potentially uh, put things on the table um, to, to, uh, to what Maria Luisa was speaking of, uh, to try to nudge some of, some of the uh, challenges forward and, and to try to help to seek compromise um, there. So that has been a challenge that I wanna, I wanna call that out for sure. And I suppose the other thing, and it came up last week uh, when we met as well um, at the Freedom Conference is that uh, the diversity of the actual working group is also a challenge as well. I mean, obviously we had to start somewhere. So we talked um, a bit last week around, around the Global South and other participants that, you know, other countries and other participants in the private sector as well that are obviously missing and potentially could could be incorporated and involved involved going forward, and I really look forward to uh, to that happening. Um, and the third challenge I would say is that uh, guidelines are guidelines, and so there is some criticism to that, saying, "Well, there's nothing, there's no meat in that," and you know, a guideline is only worth its, you know, its uh, its way of its wordsmithing essentially. So, um, but uh, but to push back on that, I would say we have to start somewhere and also so much of, particularly in, in the technology side, so much of it outpaced our regulatory and policy development and policy as as a, most of the folks that are do this, do this as a profession, it takes a long time and it takes an awful lot of thinking and, and, and sensitivity. So, so the idea of having guidelines that companies like mine can, can start to um, form concrete actions around I don't know how you do it otherwise. I think that mm. this is the, the 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 only way to do it, particularly in a, in a space where where change is happening at such a rapid pace. Yeah. Well, thank you for your that last comment. It's sort of a nice segue to the next question I was going to ask Suzanne because you're sort of telling us basically we have to keep abreast, almost on top of amount of, of changes that are happening so rapidly. And I guess I was going to turn to Suzanne and sort of say, is multi-stakeholderism, given its limitations, still the best approach to go deep and to go far? Because obviously this is a, a you know a moving target. And we see, especially coming out of Europe, Australia, some of these countries that were named and more, uh, Southern Africa now and Brazil and so on, uh, having their own initiative. You know, it, they're, they're outpacing our efforts to come up with these guidelines. How how is multi-stakeholderism still the best approach in your view? We can't hear you, Suzanne, please, uh, microphone. Yeah, okay, yeah. I hope I managed. Yeah, sorry for that. Um, well, for us at the observatory, and I think also at the Council of Europe, it's maybe the only approach is uh, multi-stakeholderism. If you want to achieve really a, a common goal in a, on a global matter, of course, uh, there's nothing wrong with going also locally, nationally, even personally. I think if we take the 
uh, other big issue of today's time, the protection of the environment, we see that it's on the one hand very important to come to uh, a common approach, but at the same time that everything that you can already do on a national level or even really on a personal level, local level, whatever it is, is very useful. And I don't think one excludes the other. Um, but of course, in uh, an, an environment like uh, the, the content environment and the, the many ways of distribution, if we really want to achieve certain standards of diversity, uh, we do need to find compromise and we do need to agree on, on these standards. And in, in our work, for example, at, at the observatory, um, we are always working in a multi-stakeholder environment. We're always trying to gather all the information from everywhere to simply understand the problems that are presented. Mm. And if we would only focus on one um, area, on one country, we would certainly miss a, a big part of what the real challenges are. So it's not outdated. Uh, it might be slow, but um, it's, it's worth it. And I'm not sure if it's slow if you don't make it too formal. And this is maybe something was very nice about the guiding principles approach. It was very much of a free discussion and where it got difficult, namely to come into concrete commitments, then I think there was a wise choice made to separate that part and to keep it for later, to first see whether we could agree. And uh, maybe that's, that was really a, a very wise decision, which I uh, still applaud. Doesn't mean that the second part has become any, any easier though. But maybe that's a, another point that you want to raise anyhow. Yeah, what I, what I hear from you, and I guess I heard it from Tessa as well, is that there's a lot of talking, but there's certainly a lot of listening as well. Mm -hmm. You're certainly very, uh, very much in the mode of trying to understand others' perspective and others' sense of these notions and even the words sometimes. What do the words mean and do they mean the same to all? So I guess that uh, multi-stakeholderism allows the group to come together, countries to come together, and stakeholders to come together. If I may just add something which is really a, a fundamental experience of the observatory. Often our task is indeed listening and moderating um, a general discussion in terms of agreeing on a common methodology, because it doesn't help if we think we talk, but we are not really talking about the same things, because we haven't taken the time to define and to understand how others define and then to really come to a very basic consensus on the language that we use. And if you, if you do this at the beginning, it definitely pays off at the end and lots of our data um, are only possible because we made things comparable through a lengthy process of uh, mm. uh, um, exchanges. Yeah, and you're very rigorous in making those comparisons and these notions come together. That's part of your expertise. Yeah. Uh, Wolfgang, you seem to be interested in my question. Do you want to add anything to Suzanne's uh, answer to my last question? In the talking and listening? <laughs> I, yeah, a little bit, I, I want to say that uh, um, uh, multi-stakeholderism has got its natural limits. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's the point to mention it here, but <laughs> in this audience, but uh, in some cases, um, it, it's difficult with multi-stakeholderism. Yeah, but when you see multi-stakeholderism as a toolbox, uh, and you can use other tools beneath, so uh, it's it's the right way. So, in Europe uh, and in, 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 in the, on the national national level, we have to uh, also do regulation, uh, like the German Länder did, uh, for example, on enhanced findability in the German Media State Treaty or like we are doing on the European level with the Digital Service Act uh, pa uh, package, uh, with the Digital Market Act, with the Media Freedom Act, uh, to take a closer look on how big platforms can be regulated to ensure a trustworthy and online environment and uh, the freedom of speech. So we see it as a toolbox. And in the beginning of regulation, there is a big uh, discussion and the hearing of the uh, stakeholders. And then we put all things together and have to do 
uh, regulation. So we see it as a toolbox. Excellent. Thank you, Wolfgang. I was right to ask you. I could see your, your body was trying to tell me, please ask me a question. Uh, Michel, uh, <laughs> yes. Michel, uh, where are we going next? What's the program in the next year? How do you see this evolving? And maybe uh, two subsidiary question. Uh, one is how can people uh, who are listening to us or on this call can uh, join, participate, contribute? And I see in, in the people that are in front of me uh, listening to us, uh, names like uh, Akindute, Siriki, Ola, Tokunbo, Oye, Leye. Where is the Global South going to come into this process? At what point and how? Michel. Thank you, Charles. Uh, well, first of all, I think uh, Suzanne alluded to it. I think uh, we're, we're really pleased that the group was able to endorse the guiding principles as a first step uh, back in June uh, 2021. And uh, I believe we can, uh, we can perhaps post the link if, if that's not already done in, in the chat room so you can, in the chat uh, box, so you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, and we are in this phase of, uh, of you know, talking about the, the, the guiding principles and, and trying to, um, you know, gauge interest uh, to, from the wider international community uh, for other countries and civil society and other members of the private sector as well. Um, so, so that's really the, the phase that the project is engaged in right now. Uh, we would like to expand the membership of the working group to include uh, more diverse voices from the global south um, because we think diversity is important as well on this table uh, and i know there have been conversations to that effect uh, and we hope to be, to be able to announce uh, you know those uh, those additions soon um, another thing i will say is that if members of the audience have projects underway that could align with the principles, uh, they can feel free to reach out to the Diversity of Content Online team and we can post a, an email address so you can uh, uh, contact the team. Um, and again, like I think it's a very important and timely issue, uh, the issue of diversity of content online and we really welcome uh, your participation in the process, whether it's to um, uh, show that you support the guiding principles uh, whether you want to be part of this uh, of this initiative in one way or another, uh, you know, we welcome uh, your participation. Yeah, and Michelle, we could add that uh, you were saying at some point, we're, or was it I think Matthew that said we're trying to assess from the users and you know how is diversity, and I believe a survey or research was conducted and evidence is also feeding into the process of the working group drafting those guidelines. And uh, should there be uh, research, should there be uh, references to material that informs uh, the working group and the guidelines, I think you'd welcome that. So uh, that's another way for people to join, participate. Absolutely. So uh, I think um, Tessa and Maria Luisa were talking about the research that was commissioned as part of this initiative and that's available online. Uh, there's also a public opinion survey conducted in the five countries that are part of the working group. Uh, uh, the, the results of which are also available on a website that we can share. Uh, but of course, if there's participants on this call who, can, who have results uh, such as this or research results uh, that could help us um, you know, uh, bring this issue forward, uh, please, uh, please share them with us uh, as well. Excellent, excellent. Well, we have in the chat uh, Akitunde saying, yeah, I would really like that. So we have, we have volunteers, you can count on him. Uh, let's now turn to uh, Maria Luisa. You've been very quiet. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get uh, give you a chance. Anything you want to add before we go to questions? Uh, I think uh, maybe. Well, I, I would have a few more comments, but I think it's better to to leave it to uh, the questions to drive the conversation. Maybe just something on on what uh, Wolfgang has said. Uh, you know, I do I do sh uh, sh I do understand and I do share. Um, is uh, approach about the fact that at some point the state need to regulate. We've seen in this area that self-regulation has been uh, sort of a failure. So I and and uh, lead to multi-stakeholderism can go up to uh, you know until a certain uh, a certain point. But then most probably we need state regulation. I just wanted to share with you something I've heard in a previous session uh, of the IGF today. They were discussing about digital autonomy, and and someone said. 
what we need to do is we need to try to have a proper setting to minimize the need for state regulation. And I think this sentence, this concept can be very much applied in here. Uh, the moment we can create consensus on a multi-stakeholder uh, level on specific concepts, and the moment we can share a vision of how those markets should work for the benefits of business, of users, but also of our democracy, and we agree on the role that, that they have for our democracy, uh, then it's going to be uh, easier for state uh, to regulate and we're going to need less regulation, I suppose. Uh, so that might be one of our, one of the hopes to have and one of the tasks that we could uh, attribute to multi-stakeholder exercises. Yeah, I guess I guess what you're, you're suggesting, we normally say we're trying to serve public interest, but I guess we're trying here to serve world public interest or global public interest and to define those standards. I guess we also try challenge. to say, I mean, as a global organization, we are always exposed to different kinds of states and different kinds of state regulation. So once again, you know, it's a very context specific. So the idea that there is one stop shop solution and then as long as the state regulates everywhere and every time. Okay. Uh, Tessa or Suzanne, before I go to the room, I know there are questions in the room, Tessa and Suzanne, before I go to the room. Tessa. Um, I guess the only other thing that I would add to is just gonna be safe on the guidelines thing being, being converted, the guidelines being converted into actual action. If people have ideas around that as well, I, I know that the working group would welcome suggestions um, in particular. So my company, for example, we're, we're really interested in AI, AI auditing and we do that with some of our clients and customers and partners. Um, but then that also can lead to further ideas around things like, you know, in the process of doing that, we've also created really interesting data sets. And we know that data sets are very, um, yeah, data sets that are being used as the engines of a lot of machine learning technology in the, in the information space right now are very, there's like five sources essentially right now. So also diversity uh, coming at, like everything I've learned around around this working group and the things that have come up have led to ideas around how we can actually uh, take the principles, the guiding principles and then actually create action that uh, that within our own company that will help our company and also help all the folks that we work with. Excellent, I like that. I have to say that's very, a very good, con excellent contribution. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, so IGF5, that's the name I have on my screen. The voice is yours. Please field us your questions. Hello, the moderator in Krakowitz. We're listening. If you have any questions for us. Krakowice, I should say. I have a question, actually. Oh, Maybe it's... Please introduce yourself, who you are. My and... name is Andre Sherbush. That's interesting that I'm from, uh, actually, from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Okay. <laughs> and uh, since that, uh, I'm a researcher in this field, and in particular, in market stakeholder approach in particular. And maybe I will be useful for the group. Uh, so that's the, my question is really practical. How to join it and how to organize this work. Maybe to better to have my, some, some competence. I'd like to in, in, invite cooperation, actually. That's not a question, it's just, it's just a proposal. Thank you. Okay. And just for, for the benefit of us all, uh, are you, uh, do you represent civil society? Do you represent research? Do you represent uh, uh, either a, a local, regional, national uh, department, agency, organization? Or are you yourself uh, interested in these matters? I represent academia, first of all, and uh, uh, academic community. And uh, I think, yes, civil um, the IGF recognizes this as part of civil society. Also, uh, I'm collaborating with some research groups in Canada as well. For example, I would like to... Uh, well, we uh, created a proposal to bring the IGF to Montreal 2024, 
but I uh, would like to encourage and uh, encourage uh, to support this initiative. But as well, um, who I'm representative, but my affiliation now is McGill University. McGill, okay. Okay, uh, I guess the question will go to Michelle. Michelle, would you be comfortable to give an answer, please? Sure, and thank you for the interest. Uh, and maybe I'll let Aaron and Matthew complete, but I think at this stage, the, the, the best way for you to get involved would be to get in touch with the team uh, at the Department of Canadian Heritage uh, to see how you can, um, uh, you can participate either by um, adhering to the guiding principles or through other means, and I'm sure uh, Aaron and Matthew will, um, you know, will welcome your your participation. Um, Aaron or Matthew, do you have anything to add? I was going to say the same thing, Michelle. Yeah, we've put our uh, email address twice actually in the chat. So uh, if you want to just send us a note, we could follow up uh, following the session. Thanks. And if uh, if you're not able to see the chat for whatever reason, we hope you can. Um, on the landing page for the session, you will see the uh, the home uh, web page for our initiative on the Canada.ca website, and our email is at the very bottom of that page. So feel free to reach reach out to us that way as well. Thank you. Okay. So we're uh, ready to have another question, either in the chat or by raising your hand. Uh, we're standing by. Anyone in the room or online, please. Hello. Do you hear me? Yeah. Oh, we do, please. Okay. Uh, I am Mohammed and I represent uh, Iran, Iranian audiovisual regulatory body. Uh, I have a main Hello. concern and question regarding uh, content diversity that I would like to ask from the experts. Uh, the thing about the content diversity uh, is so important for us because as I already mentioned, uh, I'm working in audiovisual regulatory body of Iran known as Satra. The thing is that uh, uh, we are living in media concentration age. So basically, uh, I believe that uh, every content or original content or local content should be, uh, I mean, uh, protected by the uh, regulators or uh, let's say uh, regulators bodies because uh, I believe that, for example, like uh, non-developed or developing countries regarding the content, they are under big pressure of media concentration. Do you believe that we must have a set of requirements or a set of threshold for international, uh, let's say, platforms, uh, mainly audiovisual, to have a specific place or, uh, or fair share of content uh, I mean, original content uh, or not first. And the second, how should we, uh, uh, let's say, uh, battle with so-called, uh, let's say, corporate rules? Uh, because uh, we have a very famous case in Iran when uh, General Ghassan Soleimani uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, um, under the terror. Uh, the, the thing is that all Iranian in all social medias that were just addressing the death or the terror of their like uh, general martyr, uh, the contents were being removed uh, in a very arbitrary approach regarding the content. Uh, I mean, the diversity of content is a must, but in practice, for example, in Iran, we are facing serious problems regarding uh, the platforms because they are not answering, because uh, we are getting like, uh, we are communicating with them. We don't receive anything regarding anything like child pornography. We have a very, we had a very famous case that uh, a, a woman had a like a sex chat with a, the minor, uh, and uh, the content was very like uh, distributed. We were not able to, uh, I mean, remove the content. So what do you think? Uh, you think that we need to have a set of requirements for international like uh, platforms or not? Sorry that my question was so long, sorry. No, it's a good question. I'm, and before I turn to, to our panelists, I just want to, to thank you for your question first. And to say we had a similar question last week which, which basically can be summarized in the following. How do we know we've achieved diversity? How do we measure that? Is it by the, the tone of skin? Is it by the, the names of people? Is it by you know, the style of what the content? So there, there's the issue of how do we define diversity, measure it and inscribe it in these principles, but also how these principles adapted to the future of diversity. 
not just today's diversity. So we have an open mind and a perspective. So who wants to answer the, those two very good questions? I'm sure Suzanne would have something to say on that. <laughs> uh. I can give it a try. I think uh, to really have a standard that says now you have achieved diversity is uh, super complicated and possibly the impossible. I mean, there is a, a media pluralism um, uh, measure instrument developed by the European University Institute in Florence. And um, this has um, then the, the national regulators have volunteered to try to apply it to see see whether the media that are under their regulation provide altogether a pluralistic landscape. Now, I think the first trial meant that three people uh, were fully occupied for three months trying to find out, and it wasn't that conclusive. So they've tried to simplify um, the tool. And this was only for, for a certain part of the media. So it's, it's extremely difficult to come up with any meaningful measurement. But I think what you, what you can say is that, uh, first of all, you have to have a, a, some transparency of how the sector looks like at all. And that is something uh, where we really try hard to, to give this information. For example, now in an area which is relatively difficult also to explore of uh, gender equality. I would say 10 years ago, you had almost no data. Now you have already more data. And based on this data, you can evaluate a little bit the, the, the situation, but you don't have yet any uh, common level to give a final judgment. And maybe that's also not really the final goal. And what we also see, and this is maybe relating a lot to your particular situation, it's very important that the national regulatory authorities are independent and uh, that they can do um, their, their task in uh, basically making, making sure that some unwanted content isn't there as you seem to have had big problems. And we, we, we realize the more independence is uh, guaranteed there, uh, the better is also the impact on the diversity of uh, the content. So these are some first uh, hints maybe, but it's an, an incredibly difficult issue. And, and I guess uh, the second part of the question, I, I might turn to Wolfgang, but I leave it to any of the speakers. I guess the second part of the question, which is also very re relevant, is are these uh, platforms, and I, I have to say these are platforms and companies, and we know the algorithm is not open. You know, we've heard of Tesla saying we need to have some kind of auditing of these algorithms. But uh, to the extent that the companies themselves are trying to self-regulate and anticipate regulation, they're in a way bypassing attempts to have those algorithms made clear and made available to all for us to monitor. Are they not acting in a way that are beyond our, our capacity to regulate as if they are sovereign countries beyond borders? And, and is, is it not possible that it's, it's just too late? I guess that's the question that I hear is that they will decide what needs to be removed without any guidance from guiding principles. Who wants to answer that question? Yeah, Wolfgang. So perhaps uh, a few sentences. We are exactly dealing with these issues on the European level within the uh, um, announced uh, Digital Services Act. It's about regulating the big platforms because the big platforms, to say it in my own words, are uh, for many people are second world. And so they cannot decide everything for their own. Uh, so first there has to be a transparency so everything they are doing must be trans transparent. So they can give themselves uh, guidelines, but somebody have to look upon them. Uh, so for example, the European regulator, or it's, it's the discussion within the DSA. So it's, it's a very, very, as you know, <laughs> a very critical thing to on the one hand to safeguard freedom of speech, which is very, very important for me personally. So I am afraid that we go too far 
generally that we go too far in regulating and we have problems with the freedom of speech. On the other hand side, we have to uh, make sure that illegal content murdering or something like that will not be on the platforms. So and keep this balance, it's very, very difficult uh, to do. But as you said in, in the beginning, it's not too late. It's never too late. We have to do this job. Uh, it's complicated. We have to do it on the European level and we have to do it on the international level. And that's why we are working together in this. That's one thing we are working together in this initiative. Yeah, and I, I believe the platforms are also looking for guidance. They are, you know, they want clarity on some of these uh, notions. Are we allowed to uh, extend a little bit the session? I know we're coming to the end, but I see Akin Tunde uh, with his hand raised, and I, I could see that Maria Luisa was eager to say something as well. Can we expand a few minutes, uh, organizers? Are we allowed this or not? I'm turning to either Aaron or Matthew. Yeah, I, I, I would say perhaps another five minutes or so. I, I remember they were saying it was quite strict with the ending time, but uh, I guess we'll continue until they kick us out, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Maria Luisa, do you mind if we get Akitunde's question to see whether it's, you can answer his question as well when you come with, with an answer? So please, sir, I'm happy to have you join us. Be, be, be a voice. And Actually, put your camera on uh, if you can. We can, can make the session longer. That's not a problem. You can have okay. 15 minutes, I guess. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll not extend it too, too long. But uh, Akitunde, if you could turn on your microphone and your, uh, your camera so we can see and hear you, please. Oh, okay. So my microphone is on. I might not be able to put the camera on. It's quite um, okay. where I am. It's not uh, convenient for that. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Akitunde from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. And um, I appreciate uh, the contribution so far in this forum. Um, I, my question is in different parts because um, as Wolfgang, Wolfgang just mentioned earlier, uh, there is a challenge with being able to uh, maintain uh, free speech and also uh, not go too far in the freedom of speech and also not go too far in terms of um, the, regula the regulation. Uh, in Nigeria, we already have uh, this challenge uh, that we're facing. For instance, we can't access uh, Twitter without um, um, a VPN, uh, basically because the government has uh, found a way to restrict access to Twitter because of uh, some uh, content, according to them, uh, uh, that has been posted that they didn't like. So um, I would like to know exactly what, uh, how we can address this type of issues in third world countries where the government can just clamp down on you know, access to platforms that are actually helpful to a lot of young people. For instance, many people do their business on Twitter and all. And uh, how do we you know, try and guide against a situation where it doesn't go that far? That um, while we're trying to protect uh, content online, uh, uh, the diversity of content online, we do not uh, start shutting down platforms that can also be helpful to others. And as well, um, I, I can see from some of this, uh, what I've read that um, there hasn't been much uh, research done uh, in the global south. And I'm just um, quite interested and I would like to know what we can do from here to really add our voices to, to the conversation, add our own, uh, what we expected from us as individuals uh, to do to add to this uh, platform. Thank you. Okay. And can you tell us what organization, what group, or are you with academia or speaking uh, on behalf of yourself? Uh, what's your affiliation? Uh, yeah, I'm basically speaking on behalf of myself. Do I work with a public organization actually, uh, but I'm not actually representing them on this platform for now. I have some private projects I'm working on myself with the team. So I'm okay. speaking on behalf of myself here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question. I'm sure Maria Luisa with Article 19 will be very happy to answer your, your question. Well, at least uh, ha happy for sure. Uh, as far as the answer is concerned, I'll try. Uh, this is what I can promise. Um, I've got a few points that I wanted to raise. So I do believe uh, that uh, the, the way the initial uh, question was framed, uh, it was very interesting because it started with media concentration. 
And I do believe that the majority of these problems that we're tackling, and also I do, I am very sympathetic to, to, what, uh, to, the, to the challenges that Wolfgang has put forward. So how do we, you know, balance off this need for protecting free speech and this need of, for, for regulating the big platforms? And um, um, Wolfgang, you mentioned the DSA. So I think the DSA is an interesting example because it does, uh, uh, aim to create some guarantees of you know how these services should work in a way that it, it, uh, it doesn't violate free expression. But on the other side, if we go back to the issue of, of, of concentration and how much power only very, very few actors have on our uh, information diet today, uh, maybe we can think whether the, the DSA would have gone so far. So for example, as Article 19, we've pushed a lot uh, when it comes to recommender systems, which are these algorithms that actually create, uh, used to create our content uh, online uh, for the moderation. So when it comes to illegal content, but also for normal content, normal I mean legal content or not illegal content, and the way it's, it's shaped, for modded, demoded, etc. What what we thought is why why it's only a couple of platforms that managed to do that for billions of people. Why we don't try to open up the environment and create diversity in there? So diversity of algorithms that possibly means di diversity of choices for people, and hopefully, if everything everything goes well, it means diversity uh, of a criteria uh, by which this content is promoted, demoted, set for the specific users, and also moderated. Right. Um, the second point is, uh, so, so this might be a solution, but in the DSA, unfortunately, the Article 29 recommended system uh, doesn't seem to go as far as to open up the market to, to third party players, which we think is key. Uh, when it comes to what, what can be done from the global south when we have an hostile regulatory framework, let's say, um, that's even more complex. Uh, I would say that uh, one of the, the, the safest ways is to try to have, as an international community, and I go back to the multi-stakeholderism, to try to have solid uh, international standards based on international human rights law, and then to try to push for those at national level as much as possible. Um, so this is the theoretical framework. In more concrete terms, what I would like to flag is that this example that has been raised, it, it shows... Uh, how key are certain tools like VPN or if we go further encryption and so on and so forth. So that's why we need to be extremely careful when we talk about these things and, and think that they're not only instruments that are used by potential uh, terrorists or, uh, or similar uh, in similar environments, but they're also fundamental tools to, to be used to protect free expression of people that are not in a democratic setting or are not working with a regulatory framework that protects their free expression enough. Um, so yeah, this is this is my two cents. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I guess what you're what you're also it's a word of caution for the working group and the guidelines not to dilute too much to become universal, not to lose sight of the fundamentals to try and please everyone. I guess there should be strong guidelines and that hopefully countries will join and hopefully these will be applied. I guess that's also, I, I take away. Yes, Wolfgang, I could see your hand raised, please. Only short, uh, thank you very much for the contribution of the Nigerian colleague. So it's uh, interesting, uh, but no good to hear uh, what's going on in, in Nigeria. So, so uh, but that's an arg argument that we argument that we have to invite the uh, Global South to discuss with us in the, in the initiative these problems. And that's what I'm, say, is, uh, what I'm saying, the, the platforms have to be transparent and non-discriminatory. And uh, it must be very clear when they delete something or they let somebody not on their platform, so it must be transparent and uh, there must be a discussion and they cannot do it uh, uh, like the way they want. So we have to discuss this on an international level. As if they are sovereign beyond sovereignty. Well, this is the moment to thank you, Wolfgang, Suzanne, Tessa, Maria Luisa, Aaron, Matthew, Michel Sabak had to leave, unfortunately. But I also want to thank Peter, Vivienne, Sarah, Valencia, Carlos, Francisco, Akitunde, Alexander from Russia or maybe Poland or Ukraine, and all of you for joining us in the room, Andrew and others. This has been excellent again. 
and hope we can do this uh, soon. In the meantime, thanks for listening and please contribute. We welcome your participation. Bye all. Thank you, Charles. Bye to all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.